All right. Hi, everyone. I'm trying to see if I can get more pictures showing here, more videos. I don't know if everyone is on video or not. Um, welcome to the Pathways Exploration Seminar. I'm excited to see there's so many of you joined us. Um, my name is Antonia Papandreou-Supapola. I'm a professor here in uh, the um, School of Electrical, Computer and Energy Engineering. Uh, since 1999, that's when I joined. So I've been here officially 21 years and I'm a professor in uh, signal processing. Um, so I started my first, uh, my title slide with three of the latest. Uh, this is the IEEE Signal Processing Magazine. And this is uh, to show <clears throat> how uh, the research we do uh, goes from, um, uh, it extends over many areas um, from autonomous driving to brain analytics to assisted living. Um, so all these exciting um, new applications, I'll be talking a little bit in more detail in a second. So signal processing. I, I know you already had a few other um, uh, seminars. Um, so maybe some of you joined, maybe not. Um, signal processing is um, what I like to think of. Well, of course, I'm biased. It is my area, um, mm -hmm. but it's what I like to think of as um, an area where um, we can um, contribute and help um, not just electrical engineering, but um, anywhere from biomedical to biological to um, 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 car industry uh, to radar, sonar, etc. So the reason for that is signals. Okay, what is a signal? Um, you can think of a signal as any carrier of information. So whether you're measuring the heart rate, whether you're measuring or you're looking at an image, um, um, an ultrasound, for example, or whether you're looking at an image from your uh, photographs or you're looking at um, data received um, um, from um, radar, and I'll mention why I keep saying radar so often, um, including uh, listening to your wireless phone right, listening to, you're talking with your friend, all of those are signals. They're carriers of information that describe some behavior as it changes with time. Um, and then within signal processing, we always say signal and system processing. Why? Because we like to analyze what happens when a signal is an input to um, so a point. Can you see my pointer? I'm not sure. Can you see a pointer going all around there? Yes. Yeah, I can see. Okay, <laughs> so you see this, I like to call it my black box. I should have colored it a little bit different, I guess. But the, what I put here is I have an input. So this is a signal that's going in and I have an output, a signal that's going out. So that output has been modified somehow. And I give the example of um, looking at an electrocardiogram um, signal uh, that's used to estimate a patient's heart rate. So in this, Example, uh, so you can think of um, a pacemaker um, um, where um, it saved many lives. Um, um, the way it is, it's what we call the closed loop system in what sense? So what it does, it will deliver a stimulus, a signal. Um, uh, when, the, um, when it detects that the ventricular rate has fallen below predetermined threshold. So the input will be the signal, the ECG signal itself. It does some processing to determine um, whether that condition that is being looked for is there or not. And then based on the outcome um, of that processing, we'll get an output and the output could be saving someone's life, okay? So there's a lot of systems like that that are closed loop. Um, and another example I'd like to give, which is more exciting, is me driving a Mustang um, a 5.0. Maybe I should have thrown a few more details there. What is my input? I press my accelerator to speed up. And what's the output? Well, unless I put the brakes on time, I'll be going extremely fast. Um, not, as, um, not as exciting when the police cuts us on, but <laughs> it's, still, it's still one example of an input and output. 
So here's many other areas. So radar, I, this is my area of research. I've been doing that for the last I don't know, 15 something years. Um, so radar is when um, you may be used to radar as um, um, going back to highways, there's police with radars to detect if somebody's speeding. But there's also what we call uh, weather radars that are very important, especially uh, near airports, um, uh, whether we detect um, uh, conditions that may change. Um, I don't know how useful they would be in Arizona, but I guess it depends on the month of the year. Um, once, once a month, I guess. Um, uh, but we won't, we won't, we're not cons concerned about getting hurricanes and so on and so forth, but uh, radars detecting um, or predicting something that will come based on the data, based on the signal they collect is a big deal. Um, so uh, going around here, going clockwise from the radar, um, collecting data, um, another application. So this, I put here applications that I've actually, most of them I have worked on. So even though my, my work is in radar, um, it's one of the things um, I liked about this area is that I've been collaborating with so many different people. Um, this on the right here, the deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, I actually collaborated with um, a neurological center in Colorado, uh, where they do actually work um, with patients with Parkinson's disease. So when they, uh, the patients no longer respond to medication, uh, this deep brain stimulation actually is supposed to work very similar to a pacemaker. So it's still under a lot of work, but instead of working with heart rate signals, we now work with uh, brain signals, EKG. Um, so it's, uh, it's very exciting to be able to collect that data, those signals. The person that I work with there is a neurosurgeon. They actually um, do the surgery while the person is awake so that um, after they stimulate the brain, they can actually have the patient try to write or do some different activities before and after they turn the stimulation on. And then they give us that data and we work on them. Um, so it's very exciting. Uh, the bottom here is ultrasound. I'm not gonna go into as much detail as in all of the applications. Um, I haven't done a lot with imaging, but um, imaging is just another type of signal. Instead of collecting a time series of data, uh, you look at two-dimensional um, um, time series, if you will. So it's, it's, it's a two-dimensional signal versus a one-dimensional signal. This other application here, I know it's uh, kind of a scary picture. Um, it looks like a, it is an airplane um, with a little bit of a default in the top there. Um, but I've actually worked with mechanical engineers with the Air Force. And the, the deal there was, can we put a sensor um, a device to collect data, uh, for example, on an airplane wing, and then based on the data we collect, can we actually tell if there is a crack and how fast that crack is moving, which is very important. Now, uh, this, is, um, this may look a little bit similar to the uh, uh, coronavirus um, data out there. Uh, that's not where I got the picture from. Um, but actually, uh, in signal processing, we do work. As a matter of fact, I collaborate uh, right now on a project with somebody from a Biological Institute where we look at DNA data and um, we're dealing with these biological sequences, but we can use um, those biological sequences are in terms of uh, letters, for example, or different ways of describing amino acids. Um, but the idea is, can we convert those to signals that we can then uh, process? Um, so in, in a way, be able to detect infectious diseases ahead of time, um, or being able to tell whether how successful we are in curing them. And I left, the, left this last one um, over here, these audio sunglasses. Up to a year ago, I had no idea what that was. And uh, this is me, They're looking like a superstar there. Um, these are actually um, um, glasses that you can wear and then listen to your music as you're walking to class. Um, okay, when we start doing that again, uh, soon enough, I guess. Um, and I just happened to go with my husband on his business trip a year ago in Edinburgh and they had a Christmas party and I won. Yeah, they had this thing and I won these glasses and now I have this nice application to talk about uh, in signal processing. Questions so far?
I haven't, I didn't open my chat here, but if there's a question you have while I'm in particular, let's see if I can open my chat. Nope. So if anybody has a question, I'm hoping Bob will detect it if I miss it. All right, so um, signal processing is my area, but our group, um, uh, signal processing and communications group, uh, we actually, <clears throat> we have different faculty working, not just signal processing, but also communications. Um, communications um, goes a lot more to just simply, uh, how do I get my data uh, transmitted and how is the data interpreted, my wireless phones. Um, but in addition to uh, these wireless communications that deals with a wireless laptop, um, wireless printer and so on and so forth, uh, we also have satellite communications, and that's um, um, a bigger area uh, right now, um, but also underwater communications. Uh, and depending on where you transmit, I try to find a nice picture that included as much communication as possible. So here's my diver there, although I hope in real life it, they're not that close to the submarine. But um, underwater communications is very difficult. It's not a straightforward as uh, wireless communication. So that's a, an area of big research. Moving on to networks. Uh, networks is another area. So I put here a picture of the smart grid. Uh, smart grid, what, what is it actually? Um, so think of it as um, different uh, transmission lines, uh, a network of them, and how do they connect together? And the whole idea is, um, can they help with delivering electricity, for example, around the homes and business. So how these uh, all different systems connect together um, so that um, um, uh, not only to do it as, um, um, as smartly as possible, but to save power and so on, um, it's another big area um, uh, of interest and a lot of work is going in it. And of course, I put this nice picture here from uh, the solar power. Um, ASU has a large sustainability program um, so that also involves um, uh, an electric grid. We did have a quick question. If um, the, the question what? is, the student is asking, am I correct in believing this area, the pathway, this signals area is critical for uh, instrumentation as well? So the question is, does this connect to instrumentation? Instrumentation. So um, I guess by instrumentation, um, I'm assuming you mean hardware, different sensors, connecting sensors together. Um, if not, please correct me. So um, yes, good. Hey, Tom. Um, so to be honest, I don't like to do any hardware. Um, I hate to say it. I don't know if the circuits uh, pathway has happened yet, has occurred yet or not. I should have checked. I hate circuits. I never like to touch anything. I just like to sit behind my computer and look at my data and do all this exciting stuff without actually... Um, um, uh, so. To answer your question, uh, the, the answer is no. However, um, uh, circuits need software too. Yeah, I mean, sure, so it depends, especially what you're doing. But we prefer to get the data that the circuits give us. Um, so you build up a system uh, with different circuits components. Uh, for example, the collaboration that I do with um, biological design, they actually uh, use an electrical circuit uh, where they connect um, uh, a system such that uh, they can tell when um, um, uh, the DNA um, finds the right, um, so they're trying to see when the DNA splits and whether there's uh, a good match. Um, so they actually do use a circuit. Um, so I'd like, I'd like to see the picture of the circuit they generated. Um, I prefer to just look at the data and analyze it and see what I can, what I can get out of it. Um, so um, I guess in some way, um, I look at circuits or instrumentation as we just call them this black box. I know this, um, um, in, in my, I may make it a, a bit of a generalization. However, I think it's being in signal processing, if you're also into instrumentation and circuits, that gives you a huge advantage over others. Um, because then not only do you know how the data you get, uh, what the data is and how to process it, but then you also how to collect the data and how to change the circuit to get better data. So um, they're all connected. Um, uh, it's just what, how much work you want to, to do with it. 
So I have um, PhD graduates um, that uh, did work in radar, uh, signal processing, working with the Air, on Air Force projects, and then now working in Michigan in the, in the car industry. Um, so I'm sure they have to deal with a lot more than just dealing with data. They have to talk to people that are actually uh, working with instrumentation. Um, and that's, I, I saw the question by Kelvin. That's a good question, Kelvin. So um, typical contracting term. So um, to answer your question, no, there's a lot of, um, I guess, I, so in case you haven't all seen the question, the question is, um, is the work in this field mostly contracting? So I, in academia, we write a lot of research uh, proposals and we get funding to help the students, to help um, pay for our graduate students to continue their work. So I just happen to work with Air Force um, and a lot of DOD other companies um, because of the nature of the type of work that I do. Um, however, it's not. For example, my, my husband, we went to uh, undergraduate school together. We were both in signal processing um, and um, we both got our PhDs around the same time in signal processing, but he works in industry. He works in a company called um, Circuits Logic, which is in Mesa, Arizona. And he works on um, um, noise cancellation on wireless, um, um, on wireless, I guess I should say toys. For example, I mentioned, I'm gonna go back one picture here. Um, after I won these glasses, he said to me, well, don't tell anyone yet, but I put a lot of, there's a lot of my work in there. So he was very proud. Um, so no, it doesn't, all, doesn't have to be um, contracting type of work. There's a lot of um, signal processing. Um, I have students who graduated that work in the biomedical industry. I have, I mentioned car industry, I mentioned radar. Um, so it doesn't have to be contracting as, uh, at all. So control theory, another question. Um, how they are different. So um, control, I did mention the feedback loop, so there's definitely a lot of similarities there. Um, however, um, control people uh, try to figure out how to best optimize. So if I go back to my little control loop here, um, whereas we would deal with the input and output, right? Um, and perhaps how do we even optimize the input so that we get a much desired output. Uh, controls people actually work with what happens inside the box, how to best um, um, control, as the word you'd expect here, control um, the system um, to optimize uh, different aspects of it. So we collaborate uh, with controls people, of course. As a matter of fact, the systems area is, um, uh, includes controls, communications, and signal processing. Um, but we're considered different, different fields. Let's see. Um, did I go too fast here? I talked about the smart grid. Um, see, I'm out of breath already. I'm not used to talk this excitedly in the morning. I'm not a morning person, so. Um, um, I did this for Cheryl, though. I had to wake up so early just for Cheryl. Um, um, hopefully she took a break there. I don't see her, um, but. Thank uh, you for that, okay. for doing this. I was hoping some comment back to just help me relax for a minute. Yes, of course, <laughs> you do great. Um, but anyways, um, I'm excited to be here, of course. Um, so continuing with this, um, this is, a, not recent, it's been going for, it's going on for a while here, but um, in different universities, we have this collaboration and we, we have this here at ASU um, of working with arts and media. And you can see here a few um, uh, circumstances, for example, can we, can we have an interactive performance where think about all the sensors that you can put on dancers and, and as they dance, as they move, you collect all the data. Um, so it's um, looking into interactive embodied performances for the future. So that's another exciting area. Uh, that's a specialization we have at ASU. Now, here's the faculty in signal processing and communication. Now, this does not include uh, controls faculty. 
um, so we have a very large group. Um, the blue here, in case you're wondering what the distinction is, it's not the longest names, it's just happened we have, um, uh, well, I, something that I'm proud of, we have a, a large group of women in signal processing and communications, and um, we've all been doing research in this area for, for many years. Um, but we're a good group, we collaborate a lot, um, we write proposals together, um, and it's, um, um, you'll have a copy of this presentation, I'm assuming on the, the slides themselves. Um, if anybody wants a specific a copy, I'd be happy to send them or send them to Cheryl and she distribute. But um, it just describes all the different particular areas that different people uh, work on. Now, career opportunities. So um, what do signal processing and communication engineers do? So um, I never worked in industry myself. Um, I like to, students come to my office and I say, hey, I never had a job in my life. You know, I'm so excited about that because I enjoy working with students and I think it's just fun. I stay young. Um, students come to my office and, and, and um, people complain there's too much noise coming out of my office because there's too much traffic there. Um, but um, um, it don't, doesn't mean everybody has to go to academia. Of course, academia is always uh, a possibility, but um, the main thing is we develop algorithms, right? We have data, so we have to do something with the data. So we develop algorithms. Um, so there's a lot of design uh, based on that. Um, analyzing, um, assessment, modeling, verification, validation. Um, so um, I cheated a little bit here. I went to the web and looked up I looked up positions, people looking for a DSP systems engineer to see, you know, what the, um, what they were asking them to do, you know, what, what were the specs that they were looking for. So um, you see, for example, the same terms, anal analyze, uh, look, take the data and get some information out of it, design, change the system to get different information, uh, develop and test. Now DSP is called digital, it's digital thing processing. That's what the DSP engineer is. I should have mentioned that digital signal processing. Um, and I just gave another example of a radar signal processing engineer, uh, image processing engineer, speech and audio enhancement engineer. So they all have very similar things. If you look at them, uh, pretty much they all have to do with algorithm design. So it just depends on what data you have and what, um, what you specifically wanna do with that data. Stay quiet for a minute to look at if I have any questions. So moving on, um, I put here a few different uh, names of a few different um, industries where signal processing people work on. Um, I realized that I didn't put the place my husband works on. Um, although I have to say uh, being so close, um, he they have access to all my graduating PhD students. I think I have about, about um, five of my PhD students currently working with them. I, um, I think I'm going to start asking for um, every time I recommend someone from now on. I think they need to give me some compensation. I think it's only fair. Um, but at the same time, I had undergrad, undergraduates as well as graduate students do internships there. Um, and then they end up getting full-time jobs. And it's, it's, a, it's a nice big company that, that, is, um, that is local. But um, we also have other companies. There's Motorola. Uh, Medtronics, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, just to mention a few, I was looking last night just to get an idea, um, what do signal processing, um, what are some common salaries, for example, in Qualcomm? Um, and I, I didn't put values down because I thought I should have, I should have put in, in a lot more other um, companies, but it was just, uh, just for me to get a range of anywhere from, I guess, 90 um, to 120, 130K, depending um, depending um, what degree, uh, but normally that would mean um, masters and PhD. But also um, government and universities, there's a lot of interest. Um, uh, US students, I always get uh, people from Air Force telling me, do you have any, um, any, any good students you can recommend? They're willing to have, um, unfortunately this is only for US students, but they're willing to um, to have students go there for the summer for an internship and, and work 
with researchers at Air Force Labs. So that's uh, something else um, to think about. Now, courses. Um, what are the courses, if you're interested in this area, what are the courses you should follow? Um, I guess that's the term pathways. So two or three is the first such course. I love to teach that course because then I get to um, I get to tell the students all the fun applications. Um, um, I don't often get to teach it. Um, if you're interested, I'd be teaching it in, let's see, next fall. Um, and like I said, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, my, first in, my first introduction to signal processing um, is from such a course. Um, I guess I, um, it's as good a time as any to mention, yes, I do have an accent. Um, even though you had, I know you didn't really hear it, but um, it's there. Um, um, I, yeah, that was supposed to be a bad joke. Um, so I came to the US to do my undergraduate. Yes, thank you, Lynn. I was looking at your picture smiling, but I knew that wouldn't be true because it wasn't you. I was giggling, don't worry. Yeah, I know, I know. I just needed to see some. <laughs> um, so I've been, I've been here since in the US since 1985. I came to do my, uh, my undergraduate uh, in electrical engineering and I took a course uh, similar to two or three and then I got very excited about it. I just, um, it's, the, it's the first course that you actually get to use your calculus, um, but you get to use it in a fun way. So you actually know, um, you know, why do you have to do that integral? What, you know, what benefit do I have in, in doing that? What, does, what information does it actually Give me so that calculus could be um, think of it as uh, in that black box the algorithms that we write have actually you know we have to do something to the signals so we use all these tools um, so it's the first course that introduces signals and systems um, in time and frequency domains then there is um, three or four is the second signals and systems course and that deals um, uh, some more uh, further intro into applications. Um, and then there's 350, which is a random signal theory course. Um, random si signal, I guess it shouldn't be random signal theory, I think it's random signal analysis. Um, and um, what is the difference with the other courses? Well, um, most of the signals we collect have uncertainty in them, right? A random signal means every time I collect data, there's a lot of noise in the data. Um, um, and I've noticed Kerry's question, is it uh, heavily math-based? Well, um, I kept mentioning calculus and I said to myself, maybe you should stop mentioning it so much in case it appears that's all we do is calculus. <laughs> um, it is math-based. Um, some, um, some people think that signal processing may be the hardest area. Um, um, but it's, I think it, it depends how you look at it. It's, it's things you've already learned or you're learning at this point and you just, you just actually get to use it. So yes, it is, uh, it is heavily math based, uh, but um, you end up um, learning um, this, for example, the same uh, math uh, use, whatever math related uh, algorithm I develop to detect a target flying in the sky how far is it and how fast is it going? Uh, we use the same type of math to detect um, the activity of neurons in the brain. Where is the activity in the brain and, and what is the orientation? Um, so these three courses, um, or at least the first two or three and 350 are the basic courses that you would need, that you would need them as prerequisites um, in, in different uh, in this area, so you, if you to go to the 400 level courses, so you would have to you have to need you will have to have two or three and 350. Let's see, I can't see my next sign there. There you go. So then we go to the senior elective courses um, uh, that follow from taking those junior level classes. So 407 digital signal processing. Um, that's another course I love to teach. Um, I don't get to do it often. Um, another professor normally teaches it that designed um, the lab related to this course. So these are four, four credit courses. 
um, the lab is software um, based, um, but um, it just takes a lot of the uh, methodologies we learned from two or three, the previous course, and um, um, goes into, uh, for example, filter design. So if I have an application where I have noisy data um, and um, the data um, have very high frequency components uh, based on the noise, for example, then this is what the filter design is. How do I get rid of those high uh, noise components in order to um, uh, cancel the noise and get more clear information? So the, uh, this class is currently available, Philip. Yes, these are classes that are, for example, 407. All of this, this first three courses are offered every semester. Um, so um, I taught 407 last semester and it was great. Um, 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 I had about, I'd say 10 of the students that took the 407 with me last semester, continued with me in the course I'm teaching, the graduate course in random signal theory this semester. And um, um, we just, um, uh, learning going from this is what we call signals with and signals that we're certain about specific signals for example if I um, if I have a specific um, 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 look at a specific uh, say speech signal and um, concentrate on a few frequency bands versus the signal random signal theory 554 this semester which is okay those same um, uh, speech signal has noise and how do I deal with it? Uh, communications is the fundamentals for the communication systems. And then we have the networks. Remember I talked about the main three areas, signal processing, communications, and networks. So all of these three courses are very well intended. And this is uh, real-time digital signal processing. This is actually where, I forgot who asked the question about instrumentation. So this is actually um, uh, working with um, uh, digital signal processors um, uh, looking into um, 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 more interactive uh, than simply processing the data. So another question by Kelvin, what software do we need? Um, so Java, that's interesting, you mentioned that. So 407 is Java-based. Uh, however, you don't have to write your own Java code. Um, it's just that the, the lab itself is, 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 um, is a graphical user interface based, um, created in, uh, based on Java. Um, so you don't require, uh, you don't need these courses, you don't need C++, C++, you don't need, you don't need any of the software to, um, to follow this, um, um, uh, this pathway. Um, for example, when I teach 203, I don't know if some of you are familiar with MATLAB or not, um, I like to introduce MATLAB. I think it's a great tool um, in signal processing. Um, um, so I like to introduce little uh, problems where you have to use MATLAB, but I give you enough code to start. Um, I, I guess my industry experience, going back to what my husband husband's feedback is, they use MATLAB um, um, all the time um, in the industry because they have this, uh, nice toolboxes that, um, so learning MATLAB, you don't have to know MATLAB to get these courses, um, but it's, it's something that you learn from it that you can add as your experience in, in your resume. Python is now another language that's slowly being used in some of these courses. Um, <laughs> I like the question. Uh, let's see, I have to uh, concentrate to write your name. Um, sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce your name. Um, Saverab, maybe? Just call me Sai, I like that better. Thanks, Sai. Um, so, um, Sai saying is then people switching from MATLAB to Python, that's very interesting, that question. So there's another uh, faculty who's a strong believer um, in Python, and here's, I am a strong believer in MATLAB. Of course, we both have to come somewhere in the middle. So what you're saying, uh, he said, that's what you've heard. So it is true. Right now, uh, the area of machine learning is very popular. So we go through all these stages at some point or other. Um, uh, wireless communications, for example, was a big, huge thing 20 years ago. Um, uh, and now, of course, it's still there, but other things take priority. So machine learning algorithms, um, what is it? It's just, what it is, it's a bunch of algorithms 
where you don't use any physical models. Um, you just completely get information from the data. And Python is better for that. Um, um, and I, I got distracted by reading Anwar's uh, note there. Um, it says, we're building a 5G systems and porting the code from MATLAB to Python to have a real-time response instead of the current batch processing. Well, so if I were to show that sentence to, 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 to my husband, he'll say, but you can also do this with MATLAB. So I think it's, it's all relevant. Um, the reason why MATLAB is still, when I told my husband that I was discussing this back and forth, Python and MATLAB, he said industry will not just quit MATLAB and go to Python. Why? Because um, all, everything that they need is already built and, may, and there for them. Python is still building up. So it's not true to what extent. Uh, I think personally, I think they're both important. Um, I have uh, PhD students who do the same thing, who, who, do, who use MATLAB and Python. Uh, together. So, um, uh, and I'm not sure if MATLAB, is this MATLAB one run on a Raspberry Pi that? I don't know. <laughs> um, so th that I don't know. So yes, there's things, I'm sure Python is better than, than MATLAB. Um, Mat Python has just a long way to go before they can, uh, they can get to the point where they could be as easily accessible to industry. So as far as academia concern, yes, you know, both, both are, um, uh, both are pretty, pretty more getting a lot more involved in all these classes. So my about, I don't know, three years ago, one of my PhD students came and told me, I want to use Python. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? We only use MATLAB. <laughs> I, I reacted. I never thought I would react like that. Um, so um, Tommy says they have started teaching Python in my kid's high school. Wow, that's interesting. Um, that's interesting, Tom. Um, but I think it's, like I said, I think it's the, the just uh, Python is the in language right now, is the in software right now because of the machine learning. Um, MATLAB has been there forever. Um, so I think it just depends how much, how much more it will be end up being used in the future um, um, and how much more it will be made, made applicable to industry. Um, so let's see, graduate classes. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. I'm just, I just want to mention how many we have. I'll talk a little bit about graduate school uh, in a few minutes. I'm sure you've had uh, other presentations um, that encourage you about graduate school, but we do have a lot of nice courses. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I happen to uh, be in charge of putting together uh, courses for fall 2021 in our area. Um, and Cheryl is waiting for me to send her the list on Friday. See, I did not forget Cheryl. And um, we have to, <laughs> see, I have to, I have to stay in good graces with Cheryl. She's, you know, um, without her help, I don't know where I'll be, but um, most probably I'll end up teaching uh, when we go back to regular classes, I'll end up te teaching about a mile away if, if she wasn't, if I wasn't nice to Cheryl. So <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> um, so um, um, I mentioned I mentioned that um, the courses uh, we plan courses ahead of time, and already for for fall two thousand twenty one, there's two new faculty, and they come with two new different areas, and we plan um, their advanced. So we bring all this new research, um, um, state of the art. Uh, we try to bring them through. These are our regular courses, and then we have. So these are more specific to signal processing. It's more specific to communications. Um, uh, but then we have all these advanced special topics courses that are being offered. Um, right now, I think we have about three or four courses in machine learning. Um, so like I said, as, as the state of the art changes, um, uh, we change to stay, uh, stay up to date to make sure we provide um, uh, provide what's latest and available to all of you. And I'll see Bob's message. She'll send you to Brickyard. Yeah, she said that to me. She sent me there one year. So maybe I should look back and see what I did to her at that time. Maybe she was mad at me at something. Um, <laughs> maybe she thought I needed the exercise. <laughs> oh gosh, no, That's impossible. <laughs> she thought it was time for me to exercise some more. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anwar, I missed your I missed your question. They're interesting, but gotta go. I have four eighty eight to attend. Oh, okay. I guess you've already left. Um, so you're already taking four eighty eight. Um, 
and worse. So I guess I, I, I assume that some of you may be at this point uh, freshmen or sophomore, but I guess um, um, they don't have to be, but um, I put my, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the slides, but I put my email there um, and I'll show it again at the end. Um, um, please feel free to send me any questions. I'll be more than happy to talk um, to, uh, to any one of you. Um, you have questions, you have a specific, if you'd like to um, uh, learn more about a specific area that I mentioned, I'll be more than happy uh, to talk to uh, any one of you. Um, so moving on, this is my last slide, I believe, graduate school. Um, so um, I guess, like I mentioned, I am um, a bit biased with signal processing. However, um, um, there are areas that are definitely advancing rapidly, right? I mean, with all the information, uh, you need a way um, to analyze and develop algorithms to make all this information useful. Um, and um, you may have, most probably have heard of this uh, before, the bachelor's does not provide enough expertise. Now that does not mean that you won't get jobs. Um, it's just that um, uh, you'll get, um, um, <laughs> Tom said, is it possible to get a PhD without moving to Arizona? I'll discuss that in a second, actually, Tom. Um, the answer is yes, but I'll come back to that. So um, um, getting a master's, uh, I would definitely, something to think about. Um, I have, I mentioned all the students that went from my 407 class last semester to my 554 class, uh, random signal theory, uh, this semester. And that's because they're in this four plus one program. So they are senior students. Um, is this been already? There was a seminar already on the four plus one? Not yet? No, not, not, yet. not yet. That'll be coming up. Uh, so this four plus one program um, does um, provide a very good opportunity and a lot of students are, um, are following that. Uh, it, gives them, it gives them an opportunity to get, um, a, uh, to get a master's degree um, within a year, I guess, after you graduate with your bachelor's. Um, so I've seen a lot of students um, into the program. Um, but don't forget, however, that um, there's a huge demand um, considering uh, uh, huge demand in, in, in looking into PhDs, um, um, especially for uh, US graduates. It's a big demand in government labs. There's actually um, 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 both men and women engineers that are US are considered a minority, believe it or not, because uh, there's not enough PhD graduates. So um, there's, um, I, I get a lot of um, um, emails from people I know from, uh, from DOD labs um, asking, I just got an email two weeks ago from Raytheon, for example, asking me if I have uh, good candidates to send them. And I, whenever I get that information, I pass it around to students. Um, so um, doing a PhD is, um, um, I still, um, I guess, think about when people say to me, oh, you have a PhD. It's like, it's like, well, all I did was stay in school and do a little bit more. <laughs> you know, that's all it takes. It's just, it's just um, you get excited about a particular area and you do work in that area and you have a, a good um, relationship with your advisor before you know it. Um, I had students that did uh, direct PhDs. Um, that earned both their master's and PhD in four years. I think I have easily maybe five, six students that, that did that. So within four years, you get master's and PhD and they have wonderful jobs now. Um, so um, direct PhDs, you don't have to consider it immediately. You can start your master's and, and then decide uh, whether that's something and you can easily get switched to that. Um, going back to Tom's question, get a PhD without moving to Arizona. Well, let's just say I graduated a, a PhD uh, student uh, a year ago, uh, Judith. Um, she works full time at, oh boy, I can never say that company correctly, Northrop and Lynn, help me, Northrop and Gannum? Gannum. Northrop, yeah. Gannum. Yeah, something I said about that accent and stuff, you know. I think so. Um, <laughs> I never say that correctly. But anyway, so she, she was working full time at Northrop and Gannum, a DOD company in uh, California and she got her PhD with me. She, you know, she came to defend and she came to the PhD graduation and 
um, and that was wonderful. So no, you don't have, um, um, I don't think we officially have an online program for the PhD, but so many of our courses are offered online. Um, that is definitely possible. That's um, correct. There is an additional fee for um, if you're taking courses online, because you have to be considered a campus-based student. So then you'd be taking the online courses for an additional fee. So if you're interested in doing a PhD remotely, reach out to me. Um, you can send me an email and we can talk about it. I'll put my email in the chat. Okay. And, um, and I don't want to stop without mentioning the Dean's Fellowship. Um, I mentioned the students that are doing both MS and PhD. I have a, a student now, um, 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 a new student that joined me a semester ago, um, Abigail. Um, she's uh, got the Dean's Fellowship. Um, she started with her master's and she's going to do the direct PhD. So I expect, I expect to see her in four years graduating um, with her PhD. And what the Dean's Fellowship is a good opportunity. It is for US students only, but it's a great opportunity. It pays for your four years, uh, both summers and the semester. Everything is, is paid, plus you, get your, uh, plus you get your stipend. So it's, it's something excellent to think about. You need to, um, a professor needs to nominate you and stuff like that. But you, know, uh, you just need to uh, look at different professors' websites if you're interested, see what they do, um, go talk to different faculty. Like I said, I'd be happy to talk to anyone. And um, I, I got distracted because I saw a Greek name there, Anastasios Ioannidis. Did I say that correctly? Of course I said that correctly. <laughs> I guess it depends what Anastasio says, but um, absolutely, yeah. So yes, of course I forgot to mention that I'm Greek. I don't know how I missed that part, but anyways, um, <laughs> maybe part of my name, but um, so Anastasios is asking, is there a field of study that incorporates both communications and electromagnetics? That's very interesting. Uh, or any situations where they can both be used together? Definitely, um, as a matter of fact, a project that I worked with uh, was with an electromagnetics uh, uh, faculty about, I don't know, four or five years ago. Um, so they were, um, um, they needed someone, um, um, so you mentioned communications, electromagnetics, but um, there's, there's um, um, so in that particular situation, it was, um, they wanted to, they were working on a project where they wanted to transmit information underwater. Um, so, there's definitely, I don't know if it's other than, other than project that I worked with, I don't know if it's other specific applications, but if you want, I can look into it, Anastasia. There's definitely, uh, definitely cases uh, where you can combine all of this uh, together. Um, so, let's see. Um, that was my last slide, and I'll go back to, back to my beginning here. Of course, I'll stop again and show you my cool, audio sunglasses, which I haven't worn since March, but I walk around campus with them and listen to my book as I'm walking to class. Anyways, back to the first page. So um, you can see uh, people ask me when they come to class, have students ask me, are you Indian or are you Turkish? Well, I don't like the Turkish part because um, I'm from a Greek island, uh, actually Cy I'm from Cyprus and uh, Turkey invaded. History lesson to go with the entertainment here. Uh, I was invaded in 1974. But anyways, um, if there's any Turkish students uh, listening, I'm more than happy to talk to you. I didn't mean to imply anything bad. I have to be careful what I say. And Cheryl is recording me on top of this. Um, <laughs> um, but um, Antonia Papandreou Supapala, the Supapala is from, is from my husband. The Papandreou um, is a Greek part. Um, but here's my uh, email address, papandreou at asu.edu. Um, um, and I recently fixed my uh, website, I'm still working on it, uh, but I'll be happy to talk to um, um, any one of you anytime. Um, um, so um, let's see, um, other professors, I'm sure they are they're aware about the pathways, uh, no other professors uh, could join us, but I'm sure they'll be happy to answer questions as well. Um, now, Chris saying, any books, resources you recommend as a refresher for those of us who took two or three and three or four a few years back? Um, interesting. Um, so, um, um, maybe write to me directly, Chris. I only see your, 
um, I only see your first name, Chris. So if you write to me, I'll be happy to recommend some. So it all depends on what, on what you're interested um, um, in this particular area um, uh, that you're interested in. But um, um, I have, if, um, if you were to take 407, for example, after not having taken two or three or three or four for a, uh, for a few years, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure um, we always start with a review, beginning of the semester, we start a review as a refresher. Um, but yeah, write to me and I'll be happy to recommend a few things. Um, let's see, what did I forget? Anything else that I forgot? Full name is, uh, let's see, Chris Sahakian. Sahakian. Um, I'm most probably mispronouncing that, I apologize. Um, That was perfect. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> um, just um, the only thing I tell my students, hey, you can, you can write to me. Um, just please never write, dear sir. I get so many of those dear sir ones and I told them as soon as I see dear sir, I automatically press delete. <laughs> so other than that, um, I'd be more than happy. Um, you know, just tell me I was at the pathway session and. Um, so, um, I know I try to make a few bad jokes during this time. If you were here the whole time or not, I don't know. I had a, another Greek professor tell me to keep my day job because I won't make it as a comedian. Um, but <laughs> I just ignore him and still, um, um, still, um, um, try to, to keep up. I try to, um, open as possible. I want you to, I want students to feel free um, um, to come to us. Um, try to encourage students, go to your office, go to student professor's office hours. They're there for a reason. Um, all right, Tom, you're awesome. That was one of the best presentations ever. Yeah. See, do I get an award? Come on. And this was in the morning. You should see, you should see me in the afternoon. I'm, I'm, you should see me then. So I guess I have to mention this because I thought it was so funny. So the course I'm presenting this, not that I'm because I'm saying I'm so good, that's not what I'm saying it, but I had, I, I, I have a hybrid course, so I recorded it a year ago, and um, the student that took my class, I guess the first couple of weeks, he didn't come to recitation hours, he only saw the videotapes, and then he came to recitation hours, and he thought I was two different people, he goes, but you sounded so serious, I he goes, that can't be you, you're so serious, I said, well, I was teaching to the wall, who am I going to make jokes to? <laughs> Anyways, um, so, um, so Elizabeth mentioned, I guess, the presentations are there. Um, uh, and I'd be happy to mail the slides to Cheryl or Lynn or Elizabeth um, to be available. Any other questions? I was just wondering, do you really have a 5.0 Mustang? That's awesome. Well, yes, I do, actually. Oh, that's fantastic. I yeah, love it. So, so what happened is I had to get rid of the, the mother car, you know, those big, cute mother cars when my, I have two sons, by the way, one is 23 and the other one is 15. Um, so most probably you guys are younger than my oldest, right? So, um, so I said, that's it. I am going to, you know, I'm going to be a, a one of those um, cool people now. And one day I was driving to school. It's a black Mustang, right? So I'm driving to school. I was going speed like the rest of the cars. I wasn't speed. I know I wasn't speeding for goodness sake. All of a sudden I turn into a zoo and these lights are coming, you know, police cars follow me in. So I pull on the side and I swear the policeman's face was, he was shocked when I rolled the window down and saw me, he was expecting this 18 year old kid. As <laughs> oh, well, I still got my pink slip and um, I went late to a to a committee meeting and I said, I'm sorry, but I have my pink notice here with me to excuse my, why I was late. So, yeah. Fantastic, thank you, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I have to keep my coolness to some, you know, when I give examples to students and I say, you know, I've got in my Mustang 5.0, you know, it just sounds better. <laughs> Well, it looks like that was all of our questions and um, uh, any others while we're here? If not, uh, thank you very, very much for your time today. And uh, Yeah, thank you all for joining. I mean, this is wonderful. I'm so glad that so many of you are here. And, and like I said, please feel free to write to me. 
Um, oh, this is an interesting. So, so this is this question from Tom. So this is the area where we can make the phone systems handle our accents better. <laughs> Tom, you don't have an accent, Tom, do you? I cannot imagine. I don't know who this. Do you have is Tom on video there? I like not just teasing. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. We'll have to work a little bit better, I guess. <laughs> we'll have to work at, at making, see, we need more people working on these algorithms, you see. So, <laughs> you're welcome, you guys. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cleveland, Chicago accent, I see. Hey, careful. That's, uh, some of us are happy to be from that area. <laughs> and it was so good to see you guys, Bob and Cheryl and Lynn. And um, Gia, am I saying your name? Sorry. She, I'm, I'm not saying your name correctly. And Elizabeth, um, is it? Gee, okay. <laughs> sure.